Hello and welcome to the video. Today I'm going to be talking about understanding the cardiorenal axis, which is an important concept in clinical medicine. Because understanding the underlying pathophysiology allows for confident clinical application to manage patients with fluid overload, something we commonly encounter in clinical practice. So let's start right at the beginning. Fundamentally at the most basic level, to keep someone alive, air must go in and out and blood must go around and around. The heart acts as the pump to keep blood going around and around. And the functionality of the heart is known as the cardiac output, which is determined by the heart rate and the stroke volume. The stroke volume is proportional to the contractility of the heart. So what determines this contractility? This leads us to this important concept of the frank starling mechanism. Cardiomyocytes are made up of a series of contractile units known as sarcomeres. The contractility is dependent on the sarcomere length. So conceptually, if there wasn't much volume within the ventricle, there wouldn't be much stretch on the heart muscle and therefore the sarcomere length would be short. You can think of this as the heart muscle being all bunched up and therefore not being able to contract properly. This would represent the left part of this curve. Now, as the volume within the ventricle increases, you get more stretch on the heart muscle and the sarcomere length increases. This therefore leads to increased contractility and increased cardiac output to a point where there is optimum volume within the ventricle, optimum stretch on the heart muscle, and therefore optimum cardiac output. On the other hand, when there's too much volume within the ventricle, there can be too much stretch on the heart muscle and the sarcomere length will become too long. At this point, on the right side of the curve, contractility is also compromised and therefore cardiac output starts to de decrease. So the point here is that cardiac output contractility is directly dependent on the volume within the ventricle, which is known as the left ventricular and diastolic volume. There will be an optimum amount of volume within the ventricle, which will lead to optimum contractility and optimum cardiac output. And importantly, when there's too little volume within the ventricle, as well as when there's too much volume within the ventricle, in both of these scenarios, cardiac output decreases. Cardiac contractility is dependent on the volume within the ventricle, which is nicely seen in the frank starling curve. Now that we understand this functionality of the heart, we can see how the heart relates to the kidney by understanding the circulation away from the heart to the rest of the body and back to the heart again through the systemic circulation. Blood flows through the left side of the heart and the aorta to the rest of the body. It goes through the renal artery where blood is filtered through the kidney to produce urine. Blood also gets to the gut through the splanchnic vasculature and through the portal and systemic venous circulations, blood goes through the liver and back through the inferior vena cava to the right side of the heart to complete the circuit. This circulation has an input where you can drink fluids and the fluid will be absorbed by the gut to increase this intravascular volume and it also has an output system which of course is where the blood is filtered by the kidney to produce urine. So to maintain optimum cardiac contractility we must maintain intravascular volume. Now maintaining intravascular volume must rely on having adequate fluid intake as there will always be at least some degree of urine output all the time as blood is constantly filtered by the kidney to produce urine. So how do we maintain intravascular volume when we do not drink water for prolonged periods of time? Well, the body has this amazing mechanism to deal with this, known as the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So if you go for a long period of time without having any fluid intake, you'll become at risk of dehydration and the intravascular volume will start to decrease. The kidneys will be able to detect this as reduced perfusion through 
the efferent arterial. This will then lead to the production of an enzyme known as renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen, which is a protein produced by the liver, into another protein known as angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted by an enzyme known as ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, into angiotensin 2, which then has a number of effects which all lead towards increasing or at least maintaining intravascular volume. These effects are systemic vasoconstriction, but importantly at the level of the afferent arterial and more so at the efferent arterial in order to overall reduce but maintain renal perfusion. Sympathetic activation, which also promotes vasoconstriction, increasing total peripheral resistance and maintaining blood pressure. Increasing aldosterone production, which supports sodium reabsorption and increasing antidiuretic hormone production from the pituitary gland to allow for increased water reabsorption. And so the combination of sodium retention and water retention, as well as systemic vasoconstriction and reducing glomerular filtration rate, all leads to increasing or at least maintaining intravascular volume which of course maintains cardiac contractility even when there is no fluid intake. And so you can see your intravascular volume is dependent on both your intake and your output, which of course is modulated by the renin and your tensin aldosterone system. This is great in the short term because it means you can still maintain intravascular volume and therefore adequate cardiac output even when you don't have access to fluids. But in the setting of heart failure, and in the long term, this mechanism can become maladaptive. When you are hypovolemic or dehydrated, you get decreased intravascular volume and therefore decreased perfusion to the kidneys. Similarly, in heart failure, if there is reduced cardiac output, there will also be reduced perfusion to the kidneys, and therefore the same trigger for activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If there is chronic heart failure, this renin angiotensin aldosterone system will therefore be chronically activated, which of course will lead to chronic sodium and fluid retention and increased afterload. The heart will then have to pump against this increased afterload, which will lead to cardiac remodeling and therefore diastolic dysfunction and ultimately systolic dysfunction as well. Which of course creates this vicious cycle. And so your Frank Starling curve in the setting of heart failure will start to flatten as shown in this red curve here. And so if we know that the problem in heart failure is reduced cardiac output and therefore reduced perfusion to the kidneys and therefore hyperactivation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it follows that treatment of chronic heart failure, especially heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, would involve trying to block this RAS system, also known as neurohormonal blockade. Now they have tried renin inhibitors, but this was not very successful, and so the mainstay of treating chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is that of blocking ACE through ACE inhibitors, so medications that end in PRIL, or blocking the receptor for angiotensin 2 with medications that end in SARTAN. You can also use certain beta blockers and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists which block the action of aldosterone. And more recently, we can also use medications such as Sacubitru, which promotes naturesis as well as, even more recently, the SGLT2, or sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors. So how do we treat acute exacerbations of heart failure? Well, looking at this frank styling curve, as we discussed previously, in heart failure, the frank styling curve flattens out, as seen in this red curve here. And so we essentially go from this point to this point. Now this is somewhat of an adaptive mechanism because with reduced cardiac output 
there is increased residual volume in the left ventricle at the end of diastole, and this therefore will lead to an increased cardiac output up to a point where even though you have heart failure, your cardiac output is optimized and therefore you remain compensated. When patients present with an acute exacerbation of heart failure, they often present overloaded, as in they are too far right on the frank Starling curve. If there is significant fluid overload and therefore significant reduction in cardiac output, there will also be a reduction in the perfusion of blood to the kidneys and therefore effectively the kidneys will have a pre-renal acute kidney injury. This phenomena is known as cardiorenal syndrome associated with an acute kidney injury or CRSAKI and this is not an uncommon phenomena that we see when patients present with heart failure exacerbations. It is important to recognize the presence of cardiorenal syndrome associated acute kidney injury because despite the presence of a pre-renal acute kidney injury, the patient must still be diuresed in order to get better because the pathophysiology here, the problem is that the patient is too far right on the frank Starling curve and so the only way that they can improve their cardiac output is actually to diurese them, to bring them all the way back leftwards towards their optimum cardiac output. Being careful not to over diurese the patient because by shifting the patient too far left on the frank Starling curve towards hypovolemia, that will also reduce the cardiac output and also worsen the pre-renal acute kidney injury. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you now have a better understanding of the cardiorenal axis in terms of the underlying pathophysiology and the clinical application. Here is a slide of the key take home messages we have discussed throughout this video for your review. If you like this content, please leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel. All the best.